More than 450 years ago, navigators discovered a new land to the west of the British Isles and Europe. In 1497, one of them, John Cabot, a well-known sea captain of Bristol, England, sailed westward to America. Again, in 1498, he returned to the new land, this time seeking a shortcut across it to the spices and riches of the Orient. While John Cabot did not find a Northwest Passage to the Orient, the men of Bristol still believed in it. Among the Bristol navigators who held firmly to their faith in the elusive passage was Sebastian Cabot, son of John. In 1508, he sailed westward in the search. He too failed. Sebastian Cabot, persisting in his belief in a shortcut to the East Indies, prepared his ships once more for the long journey. And in 1553, sent them out from Bristol. The search was futile. Many men since then have crossed the ocean westward, penetrating the frozen wastes of the Arctic. Cartier, Frobisher, Davis, Drake, Hudson, Baffin, Fox, James, Parry. Franklin, and other great explorers. McClure and Amundsen, much later, proved that such a passage might really exist. But a route across North America for deep draft ships remained to be found. In recent years, the Arctic areas have become increasingly important. The Navy's Military Sea Transportation Service supply ships, moving into the area during the short summers, have brought men and supplies necessary for defensive purposes. Here, where nothing exists except what men bring in, the United States and Canada have built the Dew Line, the distant early warning line of radar installations stretching across the frozen top of North America as a defense against possible enemy attack. The MSTS ships rounding Point Barrow in the west and continuing eastward have not been able to move across certain uncharted areas which might provide an escape route eastward into the Atlantic. In recent years, Coast Guard cutters with the Navy's hydrographic survey groups have charted eastward to Shepherd Bay. Arctic ice along this route near Dew Line installations prevents entry by supply ships from the west except for a short time in summer. An eastern escape route would provide more time for the ships to unload and depart. During the summer of 1957, Coast Guard cutters will attempt to extend the survey of uncharted waters adjacent to the Dew Line stations. Here in Miami, Florida, one Coast Guard cutter, the Bramble, is being prepared with protective sheathing for such service in Arctic ice fields. A new type of propeller is also being installed, designed for operations in heavy ice. Bramble with two other Coast Guard cutters, the Spar and the Storis, will comprise the hydrographic survey unit. I am a member of the Bramble's crew. We leave tomorrow. Meanwhile, there is liberty ashore for the men. It is not likely that the Arctic will provide us with anything like this. We're ready to depart from Miami on May 26, 1957. The Spar is to meet us at the Panama Canal. The Bramble leaves her home port and her families. If our voyage is successful, we will circumnavigate the North American continent and return here. And if we find the charting task is impossible because of ice fields or other causes, but that's something we'll learn when we reach the Arctic. When a ship goes to sea, a man leaves many things behind, but not his memories, the things he hopes to find upon his return. The ship's drills take up the slack, tighten the discipline, place everything and everyone in ship-shape condition. The trip down from Miami has been routine. We're approaching the Panama Canal. Electric mules are used to ease us through the locks. No one hurries here in the tropics. We take our turn with other ships going through. In Gatun Lake, we pause for a wash down on deck for this is fresh water.
We get ashore for a few hours of liberty in Balboa Canal Zone. The Coast Guard Cutter Spar joins us here. The Spar's home port is Bristol, Rhode Island, from which she's come directly to the Canal Zone. Together, we'll proceed up the west coast to Seattle. Into the blue water of the Pacific now, the spar leading the way northward. From Panama, we log 1,600 miles before we make our first port, Acapulco, Mexico. Approached from the sea, Acapulco is a paradise of white beaches below the houses and hotels that cling to its rocky cliffs and hills. We're hoping for a day ashore in this port. Some get it. A liberty party can usually dream up a lot of things to do ashore, particularly in a port like this. Ships have a habit of returning to the sea, and the bramble is no exception. One of the crew has developed what may be appendicitis, always an emergency at sea. The captain has radioed for a Coast Guard plane from San Diego. He's taking no chances with our shipmate's condition. Our small boat puts out with the patient to meet the big plane where it rests on the surface nearby. Within a few hours, he'll be in the hospital in San Diego. With luck, he may be able to join us in Seattle. That bad appendix case didn't leave us any too soon. That's a mighty long stretch of ocean from Acapulco to Seattle. Seattle. And we find some of the MSTS ships, a part of the 96 ship force that will constitute the 1957 resupply operation in the Arctic. The Coast Guard cutter Storis awaits us. She will serve as the flag for our three ships. She has been on a similar survey before. The spar and my ship, the Bramble, are alongside the dock for additional loading. Special equipment plus additional supplies must be loaded, for Seattle will be our last port of call. The Navy icebreaker Burton Island is also here as part of the main operational force. She's taken the MSTS ships into the Newline area in previous years. Equipment of the Navy's Hydrographic Survey Group comes aboard as we complete our loading. As in previous years, Coast Guard cutters will work with the Navy's Hydrographic Survey Group in sounding, charting, and establishing navigational aids along the route to be surveyed. Additional surveys will be conducted where previous work has been done, and an attempt will be made to enter the uncharted areas to survey them. The addition of an emergency heater to our cargo is a reminder that we may find the going a bit tough and may have to stay in the ice for a while. No one can predict the whims of an ice pack. We depart Seattle on July 1st, 1957. Our ships start moving out for the long journey northward. The Navy icebreaker Burton Island has gone ahead to rendezvous with us where the first ice appears. Our flagship, the Storis, moves out and we're on our way northward. The MSTS supply ships will follow soon. The Burton Island meets us as we cross the Arctic Circle, a little south of Point Barrow, where the first ice appears. Our force now comprises four ships. The Burton Island, commanded by Commander Joseph E. Reedy, USN. Our flagship, the Storis, Commander Harold L. Wood, its captain. The Bramble, Lieutenant Commander Harry H. Carter, its captain and the Spar, her captain, Lieutenant Charles V. Cowing. It is now July 12th as we approach Point Pearl. We're moving into the area some two weeks earlier than any previous ships and are likely to encounter remaining ice fields near shore. Time is required to survey and chart the new areas before the MSTS resupply ships arrive to discharge their cargoes for the Dewline stations. We pass Point Barrow, rounding into the Beaufort Sea and moving eastward. The ice pack is beginning to recede from the shoreline and we make excellent progress. This is the longest leg of our journey from Seattle northward through Bering Strait 
past Point Barrow and into the Beaufort Sea. Cape Perry will be our first stop. On July 17, 1957, we reach Cape Perry. A helicopter from the Storis takes off to pick up mail ashore. We are only a short way from the western approach to Amundsen Gulf. Our ships refuel from the Burton Island, which will then return to pick up the MSTS ships behind us and guide them through the ice fields. The cutters move ahead by themselves into the ice of Amundsen Gulf. The work of surveying the uncharted areas lies some distance ahead. To reach it, we must make our way through the intervening ice fields, sounding and charting en route. The heavy ice of this area presents a menace that cannot be predicted with accuracy. Areas which were charted and fairly clear of ice last year now appear as almost solid ice fields. Our ships are aided by the charting of Coast Guard cutters in former years. The thickness of Arctic ice is due to the extreme temperatures, shifting currents in the direction and velocity of the winds. When the ice is in a solid field, it becomes thick enough to resist impact. Progress becomes zero. All three of our cutters are beset in the ice. Open areas of water or leads may suddenly appear. Due to currents and winds, ice fields seldom remain stationary for great lengths of time. Beset again, the ship rigs a boom with a heavy weight in an attempt to roll herself free. While she's trying to work herself loose, the Stora sends a helicopter out to search for leads in the ice field toward which the ships can direct their course once they're free. Only massive force used again and again will cause such ice to yield. Watching this battle, an old saying from school comes to mind. When an irresistible object meets an immovable force, As long as there remains some freedom of movement, the chance of the ships breaking through and into a nearby open lead remains fair. But the ice shifts, closes again to trap us. During the summer nights in the Arctic, darkness never really falls. And in the lessened light, the ships continue the fight to free themselves. But again they're beset, dead still in the ice. An attempt is made through the use of explosives to shatter the ice near the ship. A large grapnel is next brought into use. The ship's engines go to work again in this new attempt at freedom. Shifting currents and winds combine again to give the ships their freedom and a little more progress is made. But the early summer ice closes in again. Charting and sounding for water depths continues with progress slow. The coastline lies within view, but it's too early for the ice to have moved offshore. The currents and winds have moved the ice once more, piling it around and against us, and we are beset. The force exerted by an ice field is hard to believe. Last night, we were in an open lead. Today, that lead is closed beneath the ships, forcing them higher and higher from the water. In its frozen form, water can possess the power of a marine railway to lift a ship of even this size. Two of the ships have been moved against each other, giving one a bad list to starboard. At a time like this, a sailor is likely to do a little wishful thinking 
Life was simple and pleasant a couple of months ago. A man could use a little of this life along about now. The spar manages to free herself and moves in to aid the bramble, breaking the ice as she comes. The storis has freed herself again. The storis leads us out of the ice pack toward open water pass a young native about to take his daily bath. He decides no bath is worth it in water this cold. We are now satisfied that despite the ice conditions, the route is passable for the supply ships that are following. We are now free to mark the survey track with navigational buoys for the supply ships to come. Moving into Cambridge Bay, we continue to set our buoys to indicate a safe track for the MSTS ships. The buoys established here in previous years have been moved about by the action of the ice fields. We pause for a very important task, that of examining the ship's hulls for possible damage. Experienced crew members who are divers go below to give the hull and propellers a careful check. We go ashore at Cambridge Bay on August 6th, and our first liberty ashore in what has seemed a long time. Eskimo children, we should have brought along those Mexican hats for them. And what Coast Guardsman doesn't like dogs? The Navy's hydrographic survey group can now begin work ashore, where reference points for soundings are to be set up. They take their sights and make their records to establish locations for the various aids to navigation we will set in this area. One of the ship's LCVPs lands parts of a radar reflector tower of lightweight but very strong material. Its parts are taken to the location determined by the hydrographic survey group. frozen subsoil of the Arctic region is this anything except drilling to provide holes for anchoring the various towers. Pre-planned construction permits towers to be assembled quickly and easily with simple tools. Such towers and other signals will serve as aids to navigation for future travelers, being visible during the day and discernible to shipboard radar at night. The Storis guides some of the MSTS supply ships through a narrow channel, and then we push on toward the uncharted area between Shepherd Bay and Bello Strait to attempt to establish the last link in the long sought west to east route. Day after day, our journey continues, noting locations, identifying landmarks, islands, channels, establishing exact locations for the track, which, with the careful soundings being made for water depths, will permit this new route to be plotted on the charts. Sometimes shallow waters make us change our course, but we slowly move ahead. From Cape Perry, we have smashed our way through the ice of Amundsen Gulf, dropped our buoys, erected radar towers, sounded through Queen Maud Gulf and Simpson Strait, skirted the west coast of Boothia Peninsula until we now approach the western entrance to Bellow Strait. For the first time, a complete route has been charted. The Canadian icebreaker HMCS Labrador, Captain Thomas C. Pullen commanding, awaits us at the western approaches to Bellow Strait, having already transited several times. The Labrador, 
The storis, the spar, and the bramble nest at false strait before making the passage through Bellow Strait. Three Coast Guard cutters that have accomplished what they set out to do. The passage through Bellow Strait commences. It is September 6th, 1957. With the Labrador and the Storis leading, we make the turn into Bellow Strait. For the first time, a seagoing ship of the United States has crossed North America from west to east. The spar follows us through as we look astern from the Bramble, with the Storis and the Labrador leading. Someone mentions the Northwest Passage and the 450 years through which men have searched for it. Radio men aboard our ships transmit the news to the world. The Northwest Passage for deep draft vessels is, in reality, a long, dangerous route through the ice fields of the Arctic from Point Barrow through Bellow Strait. Navigation along this route across the North American continent will always be difficult but an escape route to the east has been established. We pause at the eastern terminus of Bellow Strait after a safe transit. Near the eastern end of Bellow Strait lies an abandoned Hudson's Bay outpost, Fort Ross. The records of early explorers rest in a nearby rock cairn. The Bramble's Lieutenant Commander Carter, with the Spar's Lieutenant Cowing, representing Commander Wood, present to HMCS Labrador's Captain Pullen our itinerary and sailing lists to be placed in the cairn. Our cutters head for Lancaster Sound and thence into Baffin Bay en route home. Having seen all of the ice we want to see for a long, long time, naturally we see some more now. And this berg is a big one. We encounter dozens of them, of all sizes and shapes. Keeping a close watch for them, we give them a wide berth. A month ago, we were beset in the ice without movement. Today, there is plenty of roll in the ship. Bellow straight through Lancaster Sound and Baffin Bay, en route to Boston a suitable route to the east for supply ships crossing North America from the west when ice conditions prevent their return by a point barrel. There she is, right where she should be, Boston. We didn't expect this welcome on September 24th, 1957, but it's mighty nice to have it. Doris leads us in. The spar has continued on to her home port, Bristol, Rhode Island. Lines go ashore. The jack is hoisted. The lines are hauled in. Welcomed by Rear Admiral Edwin J. Rowland, Commander, 1st Coast Guard District, as we stand at ease on historic Constitution Wharf in Boston Harbor. Present also is Vice Admiral John M. Will, USN, Commander of the Military Sea Transportation Service. The Honorable David W. Kendall, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, is also present. Commandant of the Coast Guard, Vice Admiral Alfred C. Richmond, has come up from headquarters in Washington, D.C. The Canadian Consul General, the Honorable Alexander John Boudreau, offers his congratulations. At Bristol, Rhode Island, the Cutter Spar is returning to her home port. The 
families and friends of her crew watch ashore as she ties up. One little old lady and her son eagerly await a crew member, for this is more than a ship's arrival. This is a homecoming for the men of this ship. A grandson comes home safely again from the sea. Among those who welcome the spar and her crew is the senior United States Senator from Rhode Island, the Honorable Theodore F. Green. From his vantage point of 90 years, he gives them a well done. Rear Admiral Henry C. Perkins, United States Coast Guard, presents the spar's captain, Lieutenant Charles V. Cowing, with the plaque commemorating the historic voyage. The Bramble is homeward bound now, back to Miami, Florida. A porthole gets clean. Flags fly, including the Bramble's Northwest Passage flag. Miami is there in the distance. We have circumnavigated the North American continent. Me? I hope soon to lose the permafrost from my bones in that warm Miami sunshine. The first three deep water ships to circumnavigate the North American continent in one season, from west to east. Bristol to Bristol, the Spar. Miami to Miami, the Bramble. Seattle to Seattle, the Storis. Once again, the Coast Guard, in cooperation with the Navy, its Hydrographic Office and Military Sea Transportation Service, and with the government of Canada has participated in the making of history. 